Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in crypto, current, and digital assets, and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today we've got three things to go over, and they're pretty heavy, so we're going to try to get through them as quickly as possible. First up, we've got Max Kaiser, and he was interviewed on London Real, and he talks about Bitcoin, because he is a Bitcoin maximalist, and how it is the only way to go, and the only thing to invest in. And what we're going to go into is, I understand now why a lot of Bitcoin maximalists are the way they are. So the question really becomes is, are they crazy or crazy like a fox. This is going to lead us into our next article, which is a Bloomberg analyst, and he's going to tell us why the price of Bitcoin will double to $20,000 in 2020. And more specifically, we're going to take a look at the actual Bloomberg report, which pretty much lays it all out and just says, look, something needs to go really wrong for Bitcoin to not go up in price. And there was some fascinating stuff in here, uh, one of which was they talked about how Tether will definitely be in the number two spot and exactly why that's going to happen. So let's jump right in. So first up, this is Max Kaiser. If you don't know Max Kaiser, he is a broadcaster and filmmaker. He hosts Kaiser's Report, a financial program uh, broadcast on the media channel RT, formerly known as Russia Today. Interesting. Alongside his wife, Stacey Herbert, he co-hosts the weekly economics program Double Down on Radio Sputnik, presents a weekly show about finance and markets on London's Resonance FM, writes for the Huffington Post, lives in London for many years, but vowed to return to the U.S., if Trump was elected president. So yeah, all over the place. Anyhow, Max is a pretty much Bitcoin maximalist. You've seen him all around the place. He's debated everybody from Peter Schiff to all the different people who are uh, opposed to Bitcoin. And he's really been out there. But uh, this segment is only five minutes. And what he pretty much says is there's only one path and that is Bitcoin. So first of all, just so you know, this guy is wearing a microphone, uh, one of those like uh, single earpieces, and it's rubbing against his jacket. So if you're listening to this video on your headphones, you will not want to listen to what Max has to say because it's so annoying to hear it constantly rub on his jacket. I'll try to edit that out in post, but uh, I can only do so much. So before we go on, I just wanted to make mention that I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. I believe that um, there isn't one coin to rule them all. I think that's ridiculous. But Max makes some interesting points. Uh, he fails at others. And we're going to take a look at some reports, which actually lends cre credence to what Max is talking about. But again, I am not a Bitcoin maximalist. I have my holdings are as such. Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, Chainlink, Cardano, EOS, Tezos, and also Stellar. So when I talk about these things, uh, it's because I'm biased, and that's just how it is. But um, with Max here, I mean, he's going to tell you exactly why you should only invest in the Bitcoin. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I never really understood the whole argument as far as like Bitcoin or nothing. But after listening to Max, I understand what it is. Not that I, I now think that Bitcoin is the only thing to do, but I understand where they're coming from. And I think it's going to open up uh, more of a dialogue between Bitcoin Maximus and everybody else when we just ask these simple questions. So let's start off right here. What about other cryptos that have come out since that might have you know, newer ways of looking at the blockchain. Are there anything else that you see out there that potentially could still be, you know, complementary to Bitcoin? Not really. There's nothing, no coin out there that can do that Bitcoin doesn't do already or will be able to do shortly. And what you're buying with Bitcoin is security. So there's been a couple of major hard forks in Bitcoin, like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, and they're not secure. They're just not secure. I wouldn't put anything on those chains or build anything on them because they're not secure. Other coins are clear exit scams. They have huge pre-mines that the founders are selling or dumping and making a lot of money. A lot of people are losing money and they have no use case. So like a Ripple or an Ether even is an exit scam. It's, it's to be avoided. And those are, the, those are the top coins. And then you start going down into many, many more beneath that and it just becomes lunacy if you look at the total crypto market as a whole bitcoin right now has 85 percent of the hash power and 65 percent of the market cap and that number is just going to keep going higher so within the five years bitcoin will have 99 percent of the hashing power and 99 percent of the market cap right and everything else will be just completely marginalized you already see now the volume and trades i think Bitcoin now has 90% of all the volume of all these 
was between three top coins with Bitcoin dominating. They have 90% of the volume. So the, the daily volume in the other 5,000 coins is so minuscule, it's to, it's to be completely almost non-existent. So they're completely useless. They have no purpose whatsoever. Um, and, you know, so I, they, they will all just fade away. All right, so I got to stop him. So I'm sure if you're not a Bitcoin maximalist, that just infuriated you uh, because you're like, how can he talk like that? But, uh, you know, that's what he believes. You have to understand where Max comes from is, and this is a lot of Bitcoin maximalists, they've been around for a long time and they are have invested heavily into Bitcoin. It's the same thing with Peter Schiff. He has invested heavily into gold. So why wouldn't he be biased like gold's the best? or silver's the best, or tomato coin's the best, or whatever it is. The same thing with Max here. He's going to tell you Bitcoin is the best because he's been around it for so long, and it's hard to kind of get out of those biases, especially if you are in an echo chamber and you're talking to other Bitcoin maximalists. It's the same thing with um, uh, politics. I mean, when you're just talking to the same uh, group of people, uh, you'll only get one side and one perspective. So I kind of understand what, where he's coming from, and uh, I get it. Uh, but... I don't think that the argument takes shape. So some people will talk about like, look, Bitcoin is a very old technology um, and it's just, uh, it's, it's run its course. And, you know, some people will say, well, it's the, um, it's the next, it's the Netscape navigator of, uh, of the, of the internet, of the uh, cryptocurrency world. And, th and that may be true, but I got to tell you, for me, initially, Bitcoin will be the first one to pop off because everybody knows about it. Everybody is talking about it and you've got institutional investors flocking into it. And uh, if you just stop some of the street, there are, a lot of people are gonna know about Bitcoin. No one's gonna know about Ethereum or XRP or Chainlink or Cardano or whatever else, they're just not. So um, I believe that Bitcoin is going to be the, the first one to really, really hit it big. And after that, who knows, anybody's guess. It could stick around like, I mean, Amazon's been around forever and uh, you know they seem to have worked itself out. However, you got the other on the flip side of that pets.com. What is pets.com? Nobody knows because it was a it was a, supposed to be this huge uh, website when the internet came out and it just collapsed. And uh, you've seen the other the same thing with other browsers, other different technologies. Uh, they just come and go. So who knows what's going to happen? But before we move on, let's break down what Max says as far as like transactions and remittance payments, payments and all those things. So first of all, if you take a look at uh, the transaction fee or like a, like a historical chart these are just the fees uh, when he talks about you know bitcoin can do all these things well no it can't because if you take a look at bitcoin transaction fees back in the end of 2017 uh 2018 you were looking at massive fees see what was great about bitcoin before was that the fees were like pennies and you could transfer everything around the world no big deal however when the network gets congested here you've got problems massive problems and then it dropped down because people it just crashed and then stopped and then you had a big a little pump here and then look fees go up and then just like the little pump recently you went from pennies to dollars uh four dollars five dollars and uh people aren't going to pay that they don't want to pay that i mean we've already we already get uh slaughtered with our transaction fees for our credit cards and debit cards well credit cards so i mean i don't see it now the, the network itself, I mean, we've got the Lightning Network, but it's still in its infancy and it's off chain, so sure. Uh, maybe at some time it'll work. Uh, you've also got SegWit, Segregated Witness, and it, and it drops, drops off those signed transactions so it saves space and all those things. But still, you cannot use Bitcoin for transactions, maybe as a store of value. But what Max is talking about here, I think is he's talking about store of value because he cannot possibly be talking about transactions. It's not going to be used as far as currency goes. You can't go buy cop with it. It just doesn't work like that. So now we can take a look at the actual transaction historical chart. I don't really put too much faith in this because first of all, we got Dash, Bitcoin, Dash in purple, Bitcoin, SV in green, XRP in uh, yellow, Bitcoin Cash in red, and Bitcoin in blue. And you can see it's pretty stable. Uh, now we're looking at what, a three month time period. But look at this little big jump right here. This is Bitcoin SV. Does anybody really think that Bitcoin SV is really being used for that much payments as far as uh, you know transactions? Because transactions could be just anything. It could just be people passing back and forth and back and forth to infinity. So I don't really see too much credence in this, but it's just something to look at. And then you take a look at Ethereum, transaction uh, historical chart. You can see this going up. Again, I don't put too much uh, faith into that. However, I will take a look at this, and we talked about this yesterday. This is XRP 
uh, as far as the liquidity and total transactions volume between different countries. So here we have Mexico and the US. You can see down here, this is January all the way up to here. We're looking at, this is a liquidity in, in index. So we're looking at millions of dollars. So the all time high for one day was 37 million and that's somewhere around here. So doing pretty good. This is in Mexico. If we scroll down, uh, this is the Australian dollar. Uh, it looks like it's going up. If we scroll down, we're looking at the Euro and looks like again started at nothing now it's going all the way up and then we take a look down here into the uh, philippines i believe it's philippines peso or bought one of those two i was getting confused so yeah same thing nothing and then here we go all-time high 11 million so when we take a look at you know currency and transactions and you know actually like um for monetary use uh there is one example right there all right let's get back to what max is talking about and uh, he does make some good points. I mean, I won't take it away from him. So let's just take a listen. There was a lot of experimentation. And the message was always, this is the new Bitcoin. This is the better Bitcoin, et cetera. And none of them worked. So I think we can definitively say now that none of them worked. And that with, with the way that Bitcoin's going, no one's going to ever catch up to what it's been doing. And uh, it's similar to the protocol that runs like the Internet itself or email itself, right? When these protocols become entrenched and the network effect expands and they become ubiquitous, you know, there might, you never go back, right? Um, people might say that they've got the next best protocol for the internet, but, you know, they're never going to introduce it because the current protocols are already ubiquitous and entrenched and are never going to change. So it's just, that's what happens when you introduce something like Bitcoin in 2009 and it gets to where it is today. And you had the period where people tried to compete with it. They failed. And so I think, I mean, what you're talking about over there at your shop in terms of a blockchain solution for what you're doing, that's slightly different in that it's just simply, okay, you're going to have a way to, to use a spreadsheet, a very advanced spreadsheet, to make sure that you're delivering uh, what you say you're going to be delivering in a transparent way. But, you know, that's great. Okay, but it's not, it's not competing with gold, right? Bitcoin competes with gold. Ethereum will never compete with anything. It's a busted project. Um, XRP was never going to compete with anything. It's a totally busted project. Um, nothing else out there has really done anything. So I get it. When I listen to him here, because he's talking to uh, the host of London Real, and they're talking about doing some kind of, of uh, blockchain technology. And he's like, yeah, but you guys aren't competing with gold, so I don't really care. And I think that's... The conversation we should be having with Bitcoin maximalists, like, hey, um, I know you talk about Bitcoin as for you know payments. We know that's ridiculous. Now you, you talk about st uh, store of value. Okay, I see your point there. But is this your only metric? Is this your only metric as far as a currency or as far as a digital asset or as far as solving a problem? Because if that's the case, then sure, I, I you know I see your point. But I think when we're having this discussion, we need to ask those people to clarify if that's what they're talking about or are they talking about everything else. Because are you only talking about blockchain for currency and store of value? Because again, currency, I don't think you got a case here. Or are you also talking about distributed ledger technology or DLT for decentralized finance, tracking inventory, smart contracts, land and title transfers, tokenizing assets like real estate, art or business, voting, medical records for the medical industry, or non-fungible tokens for gaming and esports. Look, um, I don't b believe that's what Bitcoin maximalists are talking about. I think they're just talking about store of value. And if they want to talk about store of value, great, then that's their thing. And now I kind of understand where they're coming from. So um, I just want to open up for discussion. That's the big thing. And 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 even like Max here is, is a huge Bitcoin maximalist. And, you know, sure, God bless him. Great. But, I mean, you've also got people who are a little bit um, more, fo I'm not going to say forward thinking. Um, they see other alternatives and one of those is trace mayer trace mayer if you don't know he's like a bitcoin og he got in like 2010 or something crazy like that and he was the one that was always talking about it and uh even recently he said look the context is bitcoin supporter trace mayer argues that there may be a number of altcoins that can perform specific functions better than bitcoin and will have a reason to exist and thrive and i couldn't agree more he states bitcoin doesn't need to satisfy all the needs for all the people. Again, not one coin to rule them all. That's ridiculous. Sometimes you want a knife. Sometimes you want a fork. Sometimes you want both of them together. So we just have to keep an open mind. And that's it in a nutshell.
So again, just to bring it all back, there are some things that I agree uh, Max with, and here's one of them. And this is going to take like 20 seconds to talk about. And so um, it would not make any sense for folks to think about those, especially if they're trying to build some wealth. If you're trying to build wealth, and by building wealth, that can mean even just $1 a day in Bitcoin over the course of a few years, you know, you're probably going to make a million bucks. Instead of playing lottery tickets, and Americans spend $1,000 a year on lottery tickets, you should be buying Bitcoin every single day. Don't play the lottery. Okay, and then he goes off on a tangent, but right there, I could not agree with him more. Max Kaiser is 100% right. We spend the most ridiculous, <laughs> our money on one of the most ridiculous things at times, and we really should be thinking about the future and our future wealth. So if you can dollar cost average, what we, which is what I talk about in this, this channel all the time, I think you're going to be far ahead as time moves on. And you know what? That's not just me talking about it. Uh, CZ Binance just a couple weeks ago, May 24th, yeah, about a couple, yeah, about a couple weeks ago, he he put out a tweet. He says, "Not financial advice, but data shows more holders outperform traders." Let me say that again. Data shows more holders outperform traders, but holding is hard. Trading makes you feel like an, that you're in control. Holding feels passive, and there's a pretty good. <laughs> I love this this uh, this meme. Uh, the big money is not in the buying and selling, but in the waiting. And uh, it's a good one. So when I saw this, I'm like, that's great. I mean, how much? I mean, I'm sure people are loving this and whatever else. It's only got 18 retweets and 100 likes. And CZ Binance has like tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of uh, followers. And I've looking at, I was looking at, at his uh, profile, and every time he he sends out a tweet, it gets like retweeted like hundreds of times. So uh, again. Dollar cost averaging of just buying every week or every three days or every month, whatever you want to do, and just passively holding it, it's not very sexy, but damn it, sure works. And then Plan B even talks about it. Plan B, uh, if you don't know, he's the one for the stock to flow ratio that he put out, pretty famous guy in just that respect. And he just put out a, like, a little thing like said, look, if, uh, if you're just going to dollar cost average, if you do it for 12 months and then wait for 12 and then get out in 12, uh, then your rate of return is about 70%. Try doing that in the stock market. Not going to happen. So that's a very safe way to do types of things. And sure. Anyhow, that's it for the max segment. Let's move on to Bloomberg. So next up, Bloomberg Analyst. I always am leery to put anything about the analysts in here because I'm so sick of, of hearing like, there's a golden cross coming and Bitcoin's going to a billion dollars or just ridiculous stuff. So when I see analysts, I usually just uh, bypass it. But I saw Bloomberg, I'm like, oh, I'll take a look. I'll take a read. And it's fascinating. This one is really spot on. So scrolling down, according to senior commodities analyst at Bloomberg, Mike McGlone, the leading cryptocurrency is on track to hit 20,000 by the end of 2020. Sure, well, what do you got? So he's got four points. Bitcoin is outperforming the stock market, which may draw more investors into the cryptocurrency market. True. So we can take a look at this. Uh, this was by Thomas Lee from Fundstrat. And he said, look, here's the, the year-to-date returns uh, for Bitcoin and everything else over 2020 and 2019. Now, granted, uh, this was on May 8th, so things have changed a little bit. But roughly, you know, you look at 39%, U.S. Treasuries, gold, Treasuries, NASDAQ, credit, I mean, I mean, oil, crushed oil. So you're way ahead. And that was in 2020. 2019, uh, 92% as compared to NASDAQ, S&P 500, Russell, gold, and everything else. So when you take a look at just these two years, not too bad. If you take a look at the entire life history, Bitcoin has outperformed every other asset in existence. Let me say that again. Bitcoin has outperformed every other asset in existence since its inception of 2009. And uh, if you're taking a look at who wants to invest into what, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't want to put just a little bit of money into it. I'm not saying to sell your house and, and put in everything, but if you're pretty uh, reserved, uh, maybe like just 1% to 3% of your portfolio. Couldn't hurt, right? Or who knows? That's up to you. So there's that part. Next part is Bitcoin is getting institutional adoption as evidenced by the CME futures market. Let's see what the heck they're talking about. So this is from barchart.com, uh, crypto and Bitcoin. This is the CME futures, June 2020. And we're looking at the three month back. And we can see that, yeah, looks like the CME futures are, you know, going up exponentially. Let's take a look at, uh, well, the one month. How are we doing? Oh, whatever. But still going up. Let's take a look at the six month. Actually, we were higher back in February, lower right here. Interesting. And the one year, Again, February was the high point, just a little bit down, but we're on the upward incline. So, okay, I can accept that. 
Next up, it says the number of active Bitcoin addresses is increasing. Let's take a look. And here's the Bitcoin active address historical chart. And we can see that back here, nothing, nobody had anything. And then look at this big jump, 2017. Bam, enormous. And I think the highest was almost a billion. Looks like 949,000. And that was the highest. Now there was a huge drop off. It decreased by half. And now we're on the incline. So not at an all time high, but yes, there is more uh, addresses. So sure. That's kind of a weak data point, honestly. You can say anything's increasing. Oh, yesterday it was at 500. Now it's at 502. Increase. Whatever. And the last part is the halving should have a positive effect on the supply-demand dynamic of the crypto market. And we know that since the Bitcoin halving, which just happened on uh, May 11th, that, yeah, now it went from 12.5 to 6.25. So we'll see how that all works out. Supply and demand, correct? So that was just the interesting part. But what it really gets interesting is when we take a look at the actual report from Bloomberg. And uh, Bloomberg, they're pretty traditional straight-laced uh, group, um, but it really just lays it out like this. Look, something needs to go wrong for Bitcoin to not appreciate. Bitcoin has the upper hand, maturing Bitcoin getting upper hand. Bitcoin exchanges are in 25% of annual supply and so on and so forth. So just to, there's just a couple of points I want to go through this because I don't want to make this video too super long. So if you're a chart person, you're going to love this report. I will link in the, in the comments or the description, but I'm not going to go over everything. But they just talk about, look, Bitcoin's got the upper hand versus crypto market like gold and commodities. In the likely event of a significant change for the worst, we expect the Bitcoin price to continue appreciating. History indicates Bitcoin toward 20,000 in 2020. They put out their reason why. Of course, just historical data, which we've gone over before. I think it's going to go to 100,000, but Bloomberg's pretty uh, reserved. So sure, whatever. I think that 20,000 is in the short term. Digital gold gaining buoyancy from the metal, which they're talking about gold. Increasing companionship with gold is a Bitcoin price tailwind in our view. At the highest for the longest 52 week correlation and beta ever versus the metal, the firstborn crypto should continue to advance for reasons similar to gold fueled by unprecedented global central bank easing. I don't understand why Peter Schiff just can't get on board and be like, you know what's a great investment or the new um, uh, the new savings account? It should be uh, gold, silver, Bitcoin. Why, I, can't, I don't know why you just can't say that. Maybe because he's so entrenched into gold and that's like all he can see. Horse blinders. Horse blinders. Anyhow, moving down, crude oil makes Bitcoin look mature like gold. The lowest ever Bitcoin volatility versus crude oil indicates the crypto joining the mainstream and pro progressing toward the digital equivalent of gold in our view. Interesting. So it is hitting that store of value. Bitcoin getting the upper hand versus the NASDAQ. And of course, we saw that in um, Thomas Lee's uh, little chart. Yes, they are crushing it, being the Dow, the S&P, oil, everything else out there. And then... Um, Moving down, down, down. M more great stuff if you want to read the whole thing, but it's pretty much the same thing we've been talking about. But there was two pieces that was very interesting, and this is one of them. Strengthening dollar supports stable coins. First of all, if you don't realize it, the US dollar is actually getting strength. And there is the dollar milkshake theory. I'm not going to go over here, maybe in another video, but you can do a Google search for it. And it talks about like how the dollar is strengthening so much it is suctioning the value out of all other countries into the United States, into the dollar. It's pretty interesting, and there's some data to back it up. But when we talk about the dollar supports stable coins, the advancing dollar will fuel demand for the tether stable coin in our view. In terms of gold and Bitcoin, the dollar is depreciating, but it's going in the other direction versus most other currencies. The greenback appears best positioned as global currency values recede with all facing unlimited supply. Tether and stable coins are getting traction as vehicles for dollar exposure without intermediaries and for transferring value among the numerous highly speculative and volatile crypto assets. So without intermediaries, I mean, even if you wanted to get Tether, you still have to sign up for the exchange. You still have to do the KYC, the AML type of stuff. You have to, you know, put in your passport or your or your driver's license and all that stuff. So you're still going to have an intermediary unless you maybe do atomic swaps, not for sure. But um, yeah, I guess that's one point. But this is where it all comes down to the crux of everything we just talked about uh, in this section. Tether is on track to be the number two behind Bitcoin. Amazing. Absent an unlikely re reversal in predominant crypto trends, it should be a matter of time until Tether passes Ethereum to take the number two spot in total assets behind Bitcoin. So I'm going to let you chew on that. And uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. Do you think that is inevitable? It's going to happen because of what we just talked about? Or you can see it. 
Or do you think that's just crazy and Tether will eventually slip down to, you know, somewhere in the top 10, but we'll stay there. So let me know what you think in the comment section. And that is it for today's video. So thanks for sticking with me. I really appreciate it. I know some of these are a little long, but man, there's so much information out there, right? Uh, I feel like we have to go over it all. Try to condense. All right. But before I take off, let me just say thanks to all my supporters. So if you don't know, there's a join button underneath and uh, you don't get anything special. There's no like members section only or I, I send out information to members. Really what you get is uh, it's like a it's like a tip, really. It's a couple bucks. And if you're a level one, just a couple bucks. And I appreciate everybody who's done that. So thanks all my level ones. Really appreciate it. You'll also get these nice little uh, badges for our live stream. So maybe I should have one of these today. And then uh, for level two, they pay a little more, so I give them a shout out. So uh, shout out to All Right Soft, holding it down. When Mullet, the standard, uh, helping me out on all my live streams. Myself, who else? Dave Plummer, straight talking guy. He's got a YouTube channel, check it out. Grant Sharman. We've got Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins. Baking Benjamins, if you're into Tezos, uh, they are bakers for Tezos, so check them out. Noel Flippin' Vegas, Martin Lewin, Michael Ralph, William Howell. I like this name, the Crazy Crypto Canuck. That's a good one. Tessie Ryusaki, positive fire swing golf. That's a good one too. Uh, JC Durex Code, Crypto Veritas, Jen Miller, The Office, El Merg, or The Merg, Michael Jeffrey, The Kells Show. Kells, you better get on those videos. Mage Research, and our new one, Terry Prosperi. Prosperi? Prosperity? That's a good name. And that's it. So, uh, look, thanks for sticking with me. Appreciate it. Uh, let me know what you think in the comment section. See ya in the next one.